All right, thanks everyone for waiting. So we're going to make a start. Um, so welcome everyone and thanks for coming to this sixth weekly economics briefing on organising during the coronavirus crisis. Uh, my name's Hannah and I work for the New Economics Foundation. For those of you who don't know NEF, it's a think tank working to build a new economy for people and the planet. I'm excited to have, let's see, 104 people on the call so far. Um, that's great. Welcome everyone. Please do say who you are and where you're calling from in the chat. Um, if you enjoy the briefing, then do tweet about it. We're using the hashtag, hashtag NEF briefing to help spread the word. And you can sign up for next week's briefing already, which will be about social care and coronavirus. We'll be hearing from NEF Head of Social Policy, Sarah Bedford, Unison organiser Connor McGurran and academic Sue Himmelwaite and founder of the Equal Care Co-op, Emma Back. We're posting a link in the chat now, so do take a second to sign up. So, okay, on to tonight's briefing. There's never been a more important time to get organised than right now. Um, in unimaginably difficult circumstances, we have seen inspiring examples of people taking collective action to win change. From trade unions in the UK pressuring the government to implement and maintain its furlough scheme, um, which sees millions of jobs and incomes protected, to mutual aid networks springing up around the world, uh, we have seen firsthand that there is power in the union and power in communities. But at the same time, millions of workers are risking their lives in unsafe workplaces. Renters are accruing huge debts and facing the threat of eviction when the crisis is over. And working class and BAME communities are suffering the worst effects of the crisis, of the virus and its economic fallout. Before coronavirus even struck, though, decades of attacks on, on trade union and community power had limited the possibility of organising collectively and lowered people's expectations of what could be changed. And what have we learned from the last few weeks about people's capacity to organise and take collective action? What tactics have been used to overcome some of the barriers presented by organising to organising by coronavirus, which prevents physical meetings or mass gatherings? Some of the bread and butter of organising. How do we ensure that demands being made now by communities and organised labour lead to more transformative change when the crisis is over? To talk us through this and more this evening, we have four incredible speakers. Um, so first, we're going to hear from NEF senior organiser Becky Winson. Becky will talk about why organising is so important at the moment and how organising during the crisis might fit within a bigger picture of a better world when this is over. Then we'll hear from author and reporting fellow at the Type Media Centre, Sarah Jaffe. Sarah will talk about some of the organising that has been happening in the US, both before and during the crisis, and what lessons can be learnt. Then we'll hear from teacher and National Education Union Rep, Vic Chechi Ribeiro. Vic will talk us through some of the tactics being used by the NEU to mobilise their members and win demands. And finally, We'll hear from consultant in social justice and social change and mutual aid organiser, Minda burgos Lukes. Minda will tell us about the experience of mutual aid organising and how we can ensure the new bonds being built within communities can be developed after the crisis. As ever, as the speakers are talking, please do post any questions you have for them in the chat box and we'll do our best to ask them. We're aiming to finish before 8 p.m. this evening in time to clap for our carers. So apologies if we don't have time to ask your question, um, but do pop them up in any case. Great, so let's kick things off with our first speaker, senior organiser at NEF, Becky Winson. Um, Becky, can you talk to us about why you think organising is so important at the moment? What even is organising and what have you learned about it so far during the coronavirus crisis? Not quite got you yet, Becky. Bear with us, everyone. This is our sixth uh, Zoom call webinar, so we're still getting to grips with all the uh, with all the tech, as I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> Becky, do you want to try again? Aha! Great. Yeah. Okay, great. Hi, Becky. Uh, sorry for that little delay. That was probably my fault. 
Um, okay, so what even is organising anyway? I think was one of the questions I heard you ask. Uh, I think that's a really good place to start. Um, so organising can basically be done in loads of different ways, um, but essentially what it is, is the practice of people coming together to build collective power and then using that power to take action and change something. So that could be anything from a union organising in one workplace to a um, national um, campaign against for environmental change or to a fight against gentrification locally. What separates organising from like other ways of making political change is that it values and relies on collective power rather than capital power. So instead of using only money or insider knowledge um, to get change to happen, organisers uh, build and use people power. So my organising at NEF includes working with social housing groups, private renters, uh, trade union activists, ununionized workers, uh, environmental groups as well. And I've been organising for about, about 10 years now, just under 10 years. And obviously, like, these are really unprecedented times. And I am, like, learning so much about organising that I haven't, or some of it I'd forgotten, some of it I needed to be reminded of, some of it's completely new to me in the past few months. And I think the, the sort of like, the, the best thing that I've learned um, and that's given me so much hope over the last uh, few weeks in lockdown is that that collective power is like really real. So like you touched on in um, your introduction, there has been like a real, um, attack on trade union power and community power um, over the past few decades, both in the UK and in, in a, and across the world. And because of a combination of that and the fact that we've had like several decades of like, you know, neoliberalism and severe austerity, there's a bit of a, a narrative in the UK and across the world that that, that collective power is dead and that it can't, um, you know, it's not a way of, of making change and that it will take years to rebuild. And what has happened in the past few weeks is that what's become very apparent is that collective power was never dead. It was just dormant. Um, and I think like that's, that's like it's so uplifting for me to see. Um, I think that a, a, a big sort of reason that, that collective power has been um, able to sort of like blossom up. Um, I think number one, like the power, the power of the internet to sound like a boomer um, has like really like shown itself um, in the past few weeks. And um, I think one thing that we could all definitely learn, those of us who are organizers and those of us who are new to organizing is that online methods shouldn't be sort of dismissed as superficial or um, a sort of an easy answer. They're actually a way of allowing a lot of people who wouldn't otherwise be able to access these spaces or get involved in organizing to do such a thing. Um, I think uh, the other thing that would be really uh, interesting to, to sort of maybe explore a bit on this call and, and for people to think about is that this crisis has provided a really clear imperative for people to get active and organised and given them a very clear reason why they need to do it. And, and uh, all of us um, on this call and, and, and certainly me like know that there's been several crises over the past years and there's a big environmental crisis unfolding and about to get even worse and it's not yet seen. None of that saw this like increase in um, in activism and, and mutual aid groups and organizing and workplace power. So maybe we need to think about why it is that there wasn't a clear imperative that a lot of people could recognize um, to get, to get um, active and why they couldn't see like a clear way into doing so. Um, why organizing is so important at the moment is because that, in my opinion, like a lot of the reason um, that certainly in the UK, we are finding this crisis so difficult to cope with um, is because there has been a sustained attack for several years on any of the sort of um, infrastructure and um, safety net that, that would have otherwise protected us against the worst effects of this crisis. Like more people are going to die than could have, it, the deaths could have been prevented, tens of thousands of deaths could have been prevented. Um, the social care system is frayed. 
this, <laughs> the, the system is institutionally racist and corrupt. Um, workers' rights aren't, aren't protected. Workers don't have a voice to keep themselves safe at work. And all of those things have made it much more difficult to deal with coronavirus. Now, some of that happened, all of that happened at the instigation of governments and corporations, but there's also not been a significant like balance in the power to weigh those influences out. And that's because there's been a lack of like big scale organizing that's been effective. There have been brilliant efforts, but none of it has quite counterbalanced what we've had coming from the elites. Um, and what we're about to see after like the initial like lockdown phases and crisis um, ends is like a new wave of really severe austerity and like neoliberalism ramped up to 11. We're already starting to hear in the UK here, like, how will we pay for this? And it's, it's surprise, surprise, not going to be the 1% who pay for it. So if we're going to build a better society um, off the back of coronavirus, learn from what went wrong before it, and pr protect ourselves from what's going to happen, then we really need to get organised. And I am really hopeful that this new um, surge of power in workplaces and communities, which is where power has always needed to be, is going to be the seeds that like, help us build that new society and we can build back like all of the things that were ours that have been demolished. Thanks so much, Becky. That was a really great starting point for the discussion and also really inspiring to think. I really liked your point about the dormant, not dormant. Uh, boomer internet point. Um, if you wanted a deeper dive on some of the things that Becky was talking about, you can listen to an episode of the weekly economics podcast we recorded on organising during lockdown just last week. Um, we're going to post a link in the chat now. Um, so in terms of questions, let me just have a look. I've got a question here from David Smith. So the question is digital exclusion as a, is a real obstacle to engage with these um, most impacted because of low income or age and um, so what what are some of the other ways of reaching out beyond um digital that's a really good question and it is something we touch on in the podcast that's, that's just been linked to um, there is no like easy answer to this um the way that you would get people who weren't otherwise like like didn't have access to the internet and um, whether that's because of age or income is to do door knocking and leafleting and, and things like that and obviously in this situation that is not really safe for, your, for you or for them. Um, one thing that I've been trying to do in my Zoom calls so I work a lot in people on, uh, on states um, lo like who have like low income if, if any income at all is like all Zoom calls have got phone numbers like anyone can dial into them and that is a big like that's one barrier down like you do not need a webcam to access a Zoom call and people who are organising Zoom calls should be trying to make it as inclusive as possible for those who can't see the screen. Um, the other thing is that if you're part of an institution like a union or a big NGO or a charity um, and you're wanting to involve people in this organizing that you're doing, then like it's possible for you to like, you know, put your hands in your institution's pockets, like put some money aside so that you can like give people more data allowance or like send them on a smartphone, like it's simple to use. Um, so yeah, it's not an easy one to get round and we should all be really mindful of it. We shouldn't get too much into the habit of online organizing because it has, it has big drawbacks. Um, thanks. Just going to have a, another question for you, Becky, before moving on. Um, so I've got another one here, which is about technology um, from Luke Newman. So it says, Becky, some really interesting points there. Could the coronavirus crisis permanently change the methods and ways in which activism and organisation works? Um, can utilising technology bring more people into activism? I think it can certainly bring more people into activism. I mean, it's proved that already, I think. I think one thing I would really like to see it have a long-term change on is um, more online inclusion in the sort of day-to-day -day runnings of some things. So, you know, for example, like a trade union branch meeting, like people can dial into it and people can be present on video calls. And if they, that is the only way that they can take part because of disability or caring responsibilities or whatever, then that should be, in my opinion, there should be allowances for that. Um, 
outreach as well, like people learning how to really effectively use social media, great way to get um, added, added boost to your campaigns. However, what I would caution is that online engagement like can only ever go so deep. You cannot do a direct action online unless you're really like clever and you work out how to do like a digital picket and tie up someone's uh, phone lines or ticket booking system. Not that I'm saying you should do that. Um, so um, do include it in like new organizing going forward. But like as an organizer, people power means like face to face conversations whenever you can phone conversations if you can't face to face and then like online is usually like the last bit or it's the bit that you get people first engaged and then you go deeper with that other stuff great thanks so much um Ron, there's been some really great questions in the chat so we're gonna um leave it there with becky but we're definitely gonna come back to it if we've got time because it's a really fascinating conversation and hopefully we can pick some more of them up later um, so great, Becky, thank you so much for joining us and um, starting us off with that great contribution. We're next going to move on to our next speaker, author and reporting fellow at the Type Media Centre, Sarah Jaffe. Sarah, you've been following organising happening in the US at the moment. Can you give us a picture of what's been happening and what lessons can be learned? And thanks so much for joining us. For yeah, on. thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm I'm missing London like desperately right now. Um, so it's good to be there virtually. Um, yeah, so the organizing that's been happening in the US um, is mostly around two things, which I think are gonna sound very familiar to all of you, which is the workplace and rent. So there have been organizing for rent strikes that's getting bigger and bigger backed by some organizations that have been working on a homes guarantee. And a lot of those networks come out of, again, like the social movements that we've seen over the past 10 years. So people who've gotten involved in things through Occupy Wall Street, through the Bernie Sanders campaign, are now doing sort of mutual aid in their neighborhoods and connecting that to bigger organizing around rent, calling for rent cancellation, and refusing to pay it if it's not being canceled. And then the thing that I write about the most is, is worker organizing. So I have been following things like rank and file nurses who are organizing because sort of like the nurses in the NHS, they don't have enough protective equipment and they are being forced to go to work, reusing masks, things like that, that aren't meant to be used more than once and you've got hospital workers getting sick and dying because of this. So we've got, you know, the nurses unions, we've got several sort of pretty militant nurses unions in this country, which I could talk about forever because it's one of my favorite subjects, but they have been holding actions. They had um, National Nurses United had one outside of the White House where they brought a pair of white nurses shoes for every nurse who had died from the coronavirus and set those up outside. And you all have probably heard about the, the reopen the states protests with like white people with guns showing up to demand that people have to go back to work, right? You probably hadn't heard that there were, you know, dozens of nurses outside the White House with nurses shoes because this is not how these things get reported equally, um, which I could also talk about that forever, but I won't. Um, so there's these networks of nurses that are organizing are not just talking about protective equipment, but also they've been at the center of the fight to get some sort of universal healthcare system in the US because we have a really bad healthcare system, which is, it turns out, made even worse when 33 million people lose their jobs and most people in this country still get their health insurance through their job. So nurses are talking about what it would mean to actually have a real nationalized system. And even talking about moving beyond Medicare for all, which is a thing that people have been talking about for a while, but to a real national health care system like the NHS. So that organizing is really interesting. And again, it's built out of work that had been going on before, but it's really strengthening in this moment even though I imagine that a lot of healthcare workers are really exhausted when they get home at the end of the day. They're still finding ways to talk and pull off actions, which is really impressive. Um, I know we have a teacher organizer on this call, so I'm gonna not try to spend too much time on teachers, but there have been a few places where teachers are doing really impressive work. And again, this is building on the networks and the power that's been built over the strikes of the last, um, I guess it's been eight years since the Chicago teacher strike. 
So in New York City, where the mayor was, you know, having and hawing about closing schools and fighting with the governor about who was going to get to call for closing schools, the teachers got together and said, we're going to call for a sick out and we're going to force the schools closed if you don't close them. And that amazingly got everybody to get it together and close the schools down, although not unfortunately before 60 something Department of Education employees are dead. So once again, um, you know, it's a sobering moment to be organizing. But what's happening there is these sort of rank and file networks of teachers that were formed during some of these strikes and during these campaigns for power within the union are mobilizing like they are the union leadership, whether they are or not. So what happened in New York is this relatively small network within a very, very big teachers union um, managed to take a leadership role because the union can't legally call for strikes in New York State. Um, public employee strikes are illegal. So the union can't call for a strike, but the workers within it could organize one anyway. And because of that, you've got a whole bunch of people who were not particularly drawn to this kind of rank and file organizing beforehand. But when their life is on the line, it becomes a very different set of um, assumptions and questions. And that kind of work is happening around the country, even in places where the schools were closed down before the problem really got there. Um, I've talked to teachers in West Virginia. And of course, they're also facing the same problem of remote learning, of trying to teach a classroom like this every day. Um, in places where there's spotty internet access, which is true whether you're, you know, working class kids in New York City or working class kids in rural West Virginia, you may not have access to the internet to do your schoolwork. And so I'm really sort of constantly impressed by the work that these teachers networks are doing to build on the big dramatic strikes that everybody hears about. Um, and the organizing that's going on behind the scenes that, that most people sort of don't hear about and that I often am frustrated because nobody will pay me to write about unless there's a strike going on. Um, and one of the things that's come out of all that teachers organizing is the idea of bargaining for the common good, which um, I, I'm seeing nods, so great. Um, so for people who don't know about this already, it's the idea that if you are a union worker who has the right to collective bargaining, you can bring issues to the bargaining table and use the leverage that you have as a worker who can go on strike and shut the city down to win those demands that are bigger and broader. So Chicago teachers and Los Angeles teachers brought demands around housing to their bargaining table and made the mayors of those cities sort of acknowledge the housing crisis. And work like that, people are, are trying to think about ways now as we're gonna face just a massive austerity push in the future, right? Or thinking about how we can start to use those networks again to align different contracts so you have multiple unions who may have their contracts expiring at the same time and thus the potential to go on strike at the same time can then align their demands and use those to build more power. So there's a million other things some of you probably have questions about that are happening in the US. I'll shut up there and let you ask some questions. And I can also take some more questions in the comments after uh, whatever if people want. Cool, thanks so much, Sarah, that was great. It's really um, fascinating to hear some of the stories that haven't made it into the news as well. Yeah. Um, so thanks for bringing those. Um, just to say, if you wanted to hear more from Sarah, you should check out her books. She's the author of Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt, and the forthcoming, work, um, the forthcoming Work Won't Love You Back. We'll post some links in the chat now. Um, thanks for your questions that have been still coming through. I've got one here from Nebraska Grayson. Um, whose question is, which groups are being mobilized best right now and which groups are struggling the most with organizing and why? It's an interesting question, right? Because like I'm, I'm sort of stuck in my room. <laughs> I feel like I wish I had a better ability to get out and see what's actually happening in real time. But, you know, we've seen things like sort of big announcements that there were going to be really massive strikes on May Day that didn't really come off that way. And so one of the things that has been sort of tough for me to evaluate that stuff in a way that when I can't get to places the way I normally would is, you know, to try to sort of use the, the awareness of this organizing that I already had to figure out like, is this reasonable to expect that there's gonna be these mass strikes? Um, because there is worker organizing going on at Amazon and there are workers walking out of warehouses because they're afraid for their lives. That has absolutely happened in several states. But the question of like how massive it is, it's hard to tell 
because on one level, like understandably, a lot of these workers don't want their names out in public because they don't want to get fired. But yeah, that makes it really hard in this moment to tell the size of some of these things that you're hearing about. Um, in other places where, you know, it's it's very obvious that the nurses are, are acting and there are photos of actions and things like that, you can see it. And one of the things that I'm really sort of constantly struck by is how impressive looking these actions are when you have everybody sort of impeccably standing 10 feet apart and marching or holding um, a group of immigrant workers with Make the Road New York went to Times Square on May Day and had signs and masks and were all just standing sort of spaced out in the middle of Times Square, which is kind of shut down right now. It makes for really, really, really dramatic images. So that kind of thing, I think we're sort of only scratching the surface of how it can be affecting in a different way than just sort of having numbers in the street. Thanks, Sarah. That's so amazing, and, and thanks for joining us. Um, just can I just ask one more question? But just maybe if you could be brief, because we're going to move on in a second. Um, from I think Christopher, which is how can we work closer with American activists? Is it via Zoom meetings and online? I think I think it's a really good question that I'd love to know the answer to. Yeah, I mean, one of the things is that like there are some differences obviously between the two countries but a lot of the things that we're facing in both places are, are very 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 similar and so right now the great thing about everything is that like i can be on this call and be virtually in in your rooms in london and vice versa i'm doing a call tomorrow with somebody from london to talk about his book so we have a great opportunity to, to shrink those distances right now because you know i'm as far away from my best friend who lives on the other side of philadelphia right now as i am from all of you so it makes things sort of bigger, but also a lot smaller in a way. So I think that, that it's a great time to be building those networks. Thanks, Sarah, that's amazing um, and really inspiring as well. So thanks so much for joining thanks. us. Um, before I move on to our third speaker, I just want to do a quick shout out to all the NEF supporters on our call. So um, your generosity is helping us to fund our responses to the crisis so far and has been invaluable. Um, including supporting us to run these briefings. So thank you very much for that. If you're not an F supporter and you'd like to become one, uh, then please check out the new supporters network page on our website. Uh, we're going to post a link in the chat now. Um, so yeah, thanks again to all of you. Um, great, so let's move on to our third speaker. So we've got teacher and national education union rep, Vic Chechi Rivero. Vic, the NEU has been in the news this week quite a lot um, after demanding that schools should only reopen after it is safe to do so. Can you please tell us more about this and more broadly about how you've been overcoming some of the challenges presented by coronavirus and mobilising your members? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I think it's really clear that the government's current proposals and the guidelines that they've given us are completely unworkable. They've not been done in consultation or negotiation with the unions. And it's for us, the priority seems to be getting the economy back up and running and seems to be putting the um, priorities of profit and the rich in front of the health of working class communities. And I am proud of the stance that our union has taken in saying very clearly, we will not risk the lives of educators of children, their families in, in, in the face of this. So our position is really clear. I had a really useful joint statement out yesterday with other TUC affiliated unions saying that we need a system of track and trace in place. We need the number of infections to be a lot lower. We need to have PPE and we want the government to come to negotiating table and to you know, drop this arbitrary day and to put um, and work with us um, on a way forward. We do want to be back in work but it must be safe to do so. We're nothing but clear with that and consistent with that all the way through. Um, with regards to the challenges and mobilising during this crisis, um, as been, has already been mentioned before, just not being able to sort of meet people and sort of having that sort of physical interaction is in itself a challenge. Um, it being also sort of a novel and fast moving situation as well. So what we've had to do is sort of build network of reps. So I'm the lead rep, 
across a multi-academy trust, um, which you know, sort of covers 25 schools in the north of England. So we were quite quick in terms of building a WhatsApp uh, group and inviting the reps that we have in there. And we very quickly sort of put forward what our demands would be, knowing that schools would be closing very quickly. So those are things um, such as having full sick pay, um, make sure that agency workers, their pay and contracts were honoured, making sure that any rotor system was done on a volunteer basis, ensuring that vulnerable workers were able to work from home and those who were living with those who are vulnerable were also able to work from, from home as well. So I think with, with um, our particular multi academy trust, it being a new situation and also with the sort of value of key workers being really sort of heightened, sort of, um, you know, really keen not to be seen to sort of acting against uh, key workers or risking and are risking their lives. They were you know, very quickly accepted all those demands, which are really sort of positive moving forwards. But another sort of challenge is sort of within our sort of academy chain is we've got schools without union reps. So I'm unable to go to those schools. So what, what does that look like? How can I then ensure that we move towards 100% rep density? So what we did was a bit of a mapping exercise um, just work with some of our regional organisers and looking at schools that don't have a union rep and getting their membership list. And then what I then did was just rang and spoke to each of those members. Um, I've sort of been on a bit of training, sort of Jane McAlevey. Um, she sort of did a bit of training with sort of NE reps um, uh, amongst others and sort of, sort of looking into sort of how to do sort of organising conversations and what was particularly um, the case was Boris Johnson doing an announcement on Sunday, just speaking to primary school members, for example, saying, what, what did you think of this? You know, what can you do about What are you prepared to do about it? And across our 25 schools, we've gone from having rep density of around 50% to close to 100% um, just during this crisis, which is sort of a, you know, a real sort of example of how there are challenges, but it's about how we adapt to them and how we make the challenges of this crisis real to people and give them a bit of a sense of ownership and agency in terms of you know, being able to sort of see that they can real sort of put sort of be the sort of change that they want to see. So that's a particular challenge, but also you know, it's one thing being able to sort of widen your rep, your rep network, but how do you then deepen it to sort of include members in schools and to sort of encourage high member participation? So the sort of things that I've been doing is sort of putting together sort of members emails sort of at every stage of asking them what do you think about this crisis what sort of policies do you want the employer to put in place you know, encourage them sort of make them feel that sort of as a union it's not just this abstract thing that's been done to them it's something that they're doing and then at the same time making sure that we're sharing the successes with them so again they're sort of feeling that actually it's me as an individual it's me taking collective action that is pushing and pushing this forward and sort of building the sort of uh, system that we want to see as well. And another thing that we've done sort of challenges having sort of inexperienced reps um, and having sort of normally we have a, a four day rep program, but obviously we're unable to do that. So one of the things that our union has been doing is hosting online Zoom training, which has been really useful as well. So sort I've of mentioned sort of the sort of Jane McAlevey sort of, sort of inspired training as well. But across our multi-academy trust, we had our first ever reps video called yesterday. Um, really well attended, lots of new reps in there as well. So again, they don't feel isolated. They sort of feel that they're part of a wider collective group and they've sort of got that support network that can support them um, in there as well. Um, we've also done things like structure tests as well with our reps. So what they can do is they sort of get a bit of an idea around what's what sort of their testable majority in their school. So what we've done sort of this week is we've um, put, put a letter and that letter says that we want to put a pause on any planning regarding school reopening and getting members to put their name down to it and give it to their teacher, which for some people not used to sort of being part of a union or being organised might be a bit daunting. Actually, when you start seeing your colleagues and other members putting their name down on this sort of virtual document, another form of virtual organising, again, that gives them sort of sense of agency um, and, and sort of another way of getting involved as well. But ultimately, and I'll sort of finish on this point, you now what's particular challenge is, is that there's no return to business as usual after this. And it's really important because there's to be sort of two competing narratives here. 
The one by the rich is that this is almost a natural disaster that can be solved by charity and will return business back to business as usual and there'll be a period of austerity, which is sort of what Becky mentioned. The other alternative, and it's up to organisers to really popularise these ideas to members, that this is a crisis of neoliberalism. Now, the deficiencies in our educator system have been highlighted extremely by this crisis. Now, the reliance on high stakes testing, the proliferation of zero-hour contracts, agency workers, um, now, all of these, now, this is a crisis of marketisation. It's important as union reps that we sort of pin this on neoliberalism. So one of the things we've been doing our members communication is sort of seeing our role as reps as one of political education. So sharing articles around abolishing the exam factory system, moving towards teacher assessment, you know, you know moving towards, you know, moving schools towards sort of lo back into local education authority control. All these things is about developing that sort of alt alternative sort of competing vision because there's, there's no, no sort of, the, the pieces are up in the air at the moment, aren't they? And there's, there's no guarantee that sort of things go back to how they were, that they could be even worse. And it's, it's upon us as union reps and organisers to involve members, you know, get them active, get them involved, because ultimately, you know, build sort of education system and society that we want to see. Thank you. Thanks. Amazing. Thanks, Vic. And thanks, especially for raising that last point about political education. I think that's really important, broadening it out from, from what we're currently seeing to the kind of the bigger questions about the education system that we want um, and that we've had. And um, solidarity to you and all the teachers you're working with at the moment. Um, you can sign the NEU pet petition um, to open schools when it's safe, uh, which currently has over 400,000 signatures and read the union statement on the reopening of schools on their website and we're going to post the link in the chat now too. Um, so my question for you Vic is going to be from uh, Robert Morris. So will there be potential for industrial action if demands are not met in the proposed um, sort of earliest three weeks? Yeah it's a, it's a really important question you raised. As you know now we have one of the most draconian anti-trade union laws sort of in, in Western Europe in this country and a ballot would be extremely difficult in terms of the timescale involved. So what we're focusing our energies on instead is sort of a, a joint uh, sort of a joint way of working with all the other education unions, particularly sort of head teachers unions and the NAHD, which is sort of the head teachers union, they they've said that they will support any head teacher that didn't want to didn't want to open their school um, so we what we we need to do as sort of educate education um, sort of teacher support workers is sort of make it clear that you know, we would support any head who sort of took that action um, but sort of even before you get that what we are what we are trying to do is sort of nationally is you know sort of push the government to to drop drop the arbitrary day and to sort of go back into sort of negotiation with us so it's almost a bit of sequencing but the sort of the very last resort is sort of we can't say this as a union, but individuals are protected under sort of health and safety legislation under section 44. Um, so any any worker who felt unsafe going into their workplace, you no, know, they've nothing's forcing them to go into it. And you know, we can't say that as ad, sort of as a union collectively, but you know, any individual will be able to do that. We, what what we're sort of doing as I sort of mentioned in terms of sequencing is we've got sort of the government approach, trying to get them to shift on that. And as sort of mentioned by that petition, you know, we've got popular support you now. I'm not sure how many parents or carers would be confident sending their, their children into school at the moment. We've then got the school level supporting heads. And then sort of as a last resort was um, sort of, uh, is with the sort of individual with sort of health and safety uh, legislation. Great, thank you so much, Vic. We really um, appreciate you joining us, especially given how busy you are at the moment. Um, I'm going to move us on just because of time, but yeah, thanks, thanks so much, and thanks for all your questions in the chat. Sorry, we haven't got to all of them, but um, I see there's lots of answering questions going on, so that's great. Thank you. Um, right now, so we're going to move on to our final speaker, a consultant in social justice and social change and mutual aid organizer, Minda Burgos Lukes. Minda, welcome to the call. Um, I've heard people talk about how mutual aid should be about solidarity, not charity. 
Can you talk us through what that means for you? And also, how should we build on the organising that's happening in mutual aid networks now after the crisis is over? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so I'll start with the first question, which is about solidarity, not charity. So um, from the perspective of where we're organising locally, that's a core principle that we're organising around and it's fundamental to it. So for me, the language of should, I don't think it's a should thing. I think it's a must because I think we need to set ourselves apart from the kind of systems and structures that have already been created as support mechanisms for people. Um, I think the solidarity effort and aspect of it is about how we're working across our community to support each other and check up, sort of set up a community support system locally um, and find ways in which we can meet each other's needs during this time of crisis. Um, obviously, the thing that kind of sits, sits apart in the current kind of pandemic is that we're all vulnerable to it. It's something that we're all vulnerable to. Um, but obviously, I think that what that does do is help us to understand that vulnerability is perhaps external to us and not something that we um, put ourselves in. It's things that happen to us that create that vulnerability. And I think that that's a massive learning for people in communities, actually, is understanding that lots of people have been surviving for a long time, actually. Survival isn't a new concept and mutual aid as a response to that isn't a new concept, actually. It's existed for centuries, for forever. Um, and I think, you know, lots of communities who, who are marginalised and who are underrepresented practice mutual aid consistently and we can learn lots of lessons from those communities and there's ways in which people have been looking after each other because quite frankly they can't rely on the systems and the kind of mechanisms that are in place that have been um, depleted to be quite honest and stripped bare and and you know i feel like if we use the nhs as an example we all knew that it had been kind of stripped down to the bones and it wasn't going to take much to tip it over the edge you know and unfortunately we then find ourselves in this situation where it is tipped and and you know lots of people all of a sudden are being put in quite kind of like dangerous situations um and i think what mutual aid can offer is a is a support system locally where you can help each other and where you can consider why people might not be able to leave their homes but also what it doesn't do what sets it apart from charity i guess is that there's not a set of criteria you know that, that we're using to help people we're just saying if you're isolating or you're in quarantine or you need support we can offer you support and I think that that's quite liberating actually and I think that what that does do is 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 put ourselves in a position where we understand the value of community but also where we understand the value of people in our community um, and there are lots of pockets of our community that have been in, in communities that have been invisibilized you know they've kind of just got on with things and, and kind of barely got by each day and now they're being listened to and now they're being heard and actually we're hearing about lots of situations and circumstances you know that pre-exist this pandemic and pre-exist this situation um, so that's kind of like for me solidarity is about understanding that there is a collective struggle actually happening right now and that part of that struggle is going to impact on some of our communities as we've already seen particularly BAME communities and working class communities being disproportionately affected by um, COVID-19 and we need to recognise that we have to come together and find an alternative solution because unfortunately we you know we're not going to find it in the systems and structures that already exist and so we've got to create something new um, and what's kind of quite invaluable about this is it's powered by people it's not powered by a financial resource or by sort of you know um, someone's idea and then they're telling other people how to think we're working together and working out how to think and how to do which is an incredible effort actually and we're, we're looking at where there are gaps we're saying okay so how do we make sure that we do reach out to people that aren't um, online or, or digitally literate you know how do we make sure that we are communicating with people in different ways um, how do we create solidarity actions that people can see or, or be part of that doesn't just exist online you know obviously what online did do was create a situation where we could essentially build you know a, a, a quite a big local voluntary network I guess um, and support system in in a week you know when I think about it I think you know it was Saturday I got asked to join the Islington Mutual Aid Group. By Sunday I was a moderator on that group and running the Highbury Group in Islington, you know, and um, setting that up. By Wednesday we had a phone line, we had a website, you know, and all, you know, all these things just happened literally overnight. And, what it and that was powered by people, that was by reaching out to our community and asking people who have various skills, you know, and interests to do things. And they just did it. 
you know, once asked, they just did it. And it was an incredible effort. And I've lived in my community for over 38 years. I've been there since I was six months old. And I've never felt more connected to my community, actually. And we've had to have some quite frank but honest conversations about different people's experiences across the community. I live in social housing. You know, there's a concept on a lovely tree line street down the road that, you know, we can just move to street level and everything will be okay. And I'm like, well, I've lived on the same road for 17 years and I only know my immediate neighbours. So I don't have those relationships, even though I've lived here for a long time and I've, you know, and so on and so forth. So I think we need to really sort of look at ways in which we can organise in different ways. I think it does definitely challenge people's concepts and ideas of, of of charity and leadership actually because we're acting in a collective way because all we're asking is for people to stick to core principles but essentially you can organize and you can coordinate around anything that you think will benefit our community you know and we've got the base level of kind of helping each other with errands that we can't otherwise perform because of the limitations that we're in um, and because some people have been told very explicitly not to leave their homes you know and then we're thinking well what else will that lead to you know people that were already isolated will be further isolated going to get a pint of milk for someone who lives on their own is a, you know it's a it's a, a day trip it's a trip out in their day it's a conversation with a local shopkeeper you know and that's so it's sort of you know you walk past someone else you walk past every day they can't do these things anymore and so we've got to find new ways of connecting with people and and being able to be that you know meet that kind of gap and um, but also i think you know, we've got to be able to build trust and respect in our community, actually. And, and you know, if one of the questions around organising is, well, what happens beyond this? I think at the moment we're, you know, we're sort of stuck in resilience, right? We're trying to look at ways in which we survive this, ways in which we bounce back from it. But when we bounce back, the broken systems and the kind of like heritable attitudes will still be there. But we'll have a new way of thinking and a new way of organising. And so what I am hoping is that we lean into that and that we find ways in which we can try and just build on that, actually, and think, OK, for me, as a, as a practitioner around anti-oppression, social justice and social change, I would never talk about resilience without talking about resistance. To me, they come hand in hand. Um, and I think it's really important that we talk to our communities about well, what, what does you know this is what life looks like now but what does it look like after this do we just go back to our everyday lives and only talk to our immediate neighbors or do we build on the connections that we've made and the strength and the resilience that we've shown in our communities and think about well no you know we're not going to make we're going to make sure nobody's left behind again we're going to organize around that we're going to look at ways in which we can um, build better communities and stronger communities but also we're going to talk about what hasn't been good enough for a long time um, and we're going to try and change it so from an organizing perspective i am hopeful um i think people organize like this anyway but i just think now it's going to be on a greater scale and i'm quite excited about that and i work a lot with lots of marginalised and underrepresented communities, particularly across London. I know Becky spoke about estates and I work with three estates in Hackney. And, you know, they're, we're, we're working together. We're sharing resources about, oh, what have you done on this, Minda? OK, I'll, I'll send you that over. Here's our kind of collective guidelines and guidance. Oh, great. Um, who are you? Who do you get your, you know, food aid supply from? Oh, great. We'll contact them. And, you know, we're actually finding out ways in which we can share resources and information that will hopefully mean that we're affecting communities in the broader sense really so for me it's about having an initial this immediate response but building on that beyond that um, from an organizing perspective which I think people do but hopefully there'll just be a greater commitment and a greater understanding of the benefits of that thanks Minda that's um it's so great to hear all of that from your perspective from like how quickly those things have happened and sprung up to like you know the challenges involved and different different kinds of people being inv involved and i think the question about politics and um and the sort of practice stuff is is a really important one we had a question come up in the chat which i think you've really answered which is around um you know principles of groups say they're not political but there are people from all different walks of life and are from across the political spectrum and um you know it's it's what you were just talking about how you build how you do the sort of going to the shop and, and doing those shops but then also how you build on that conversation to take things forward so that so that we can you know build what kind of communities we want to build coming coming away from this um so thanks so much for, for bringing that perspective um, and i think i think we're going to move on if that's all right because um because of time but i just wanted to say that if anyone wants to find out more about mutual aid 
including how you can get involved in your local group. Um, then we're going to post some links and further reading in the chat now. Um, so do have a look at that. And, and thanks again, Linda. Um, we really appreciate yeah, you joining us this evening. Um, before we go, we wanted to um, do something a little bit different this evening. So that's why I've just had to shift timings a bit. Um, on this call, we've tried to provide some inspiring examples of organising uh, happening at the moment and ways that people can get involved. Um, so now we just wanted to go back to Becky again um, to hear about some of the organising work that NEF is currently doing. I know a couple of people have asked in the chat and, and also a few of the groups that you might want to support. Um, so Becky, thanks so much for sticking with us. And can you tell us what, yeah, what are some of the organisations we should be following at the moment? So I'm going, to be, I'm going to try and be really quick. Um, so NEF is working and supporting with the London Renters Union, the IWGB Trade Union, and you should definitely be like supporting both of those and joining them if you can, or if you're not unionised already. Um, we're also working with Acorn Community uh, Union. They're in lots of different communities up and down the UK. Um, there are some going to be links posted to some of these groups. We're supporting a social housing campaign in Essex, Spot It for the People, that's for NHS key worker housing and social housing to be built. That's a really great campaign. Please follow it if you can. If you're in the Midlands in Birmingham, please, please look up what's happening to Druid's Heath Estate in Birmingham. Uh, they're being terribly treated by the City Council and we're working with them to organise the re against some of the regeneration of their estate. Um, and who else have I forgotten to name? Uh, basically, you want to know what we do, check the NEF organising page on the website and you can always email me and get in touch with me about anything you want to chat about or suggest working on. I'm all ears. That was very quick, Becky, thank you. <laughs> um, that's brilliant. And yeah, thanks to, to all the speakers um, for that. I hope that everyone on the call this evening feels empowered and inspired by some of the amazing examples of organising that we've heard about. Um, please do check out some of the organisations that Becky mentioned um, and that the, the other speakers have mentioned. And if you can, get involved. Um, we're going to be posting links for all of them in the chat box. Um, so do, do have, a, have a click through and look at those. Um, these are really scary times, but we are stronger when we stand and fight together. Thanks again to all of you for joining the call this evening and to all the speakers, um, especially when you all sound extremely busy. <laughs> so yeah, thanks for making the time um, for us. Um, that's all we've got time for this evening, folks. But just a reminder that you can sign up for next week's briefing um, on social care and coronavirus. And the link is in the chat now. Um, and hopefully I will see you all next week. Thanks.